evening. Good evening, welcome. Happy World Theater Day. Uh, my name is Dick. Yes, that's right. Those are four powerful words. It feels good to say them in this room. Um, my name is Derek Goldman, and uh, with my colleague, Ambassador Cynthia Schneider, I'm co-founding director of the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics, founded in 2012 and now housed in the Georgetown School of Foreign Service with the mission to harness the power of performance to humanize global politics. Um, when people ask us what we mean by that mission, um, I think it looks an awful lot like tonight and this room and this event. Uh, it's an extraordinary gathering. Um, the energy in this room, the energy around the artists you're gonna meet tonight uh, who've been in a short residency here feels like a living, pulsating testimony to the power of theater and more broadly the power of stories to connect us across cultures and experiences across time and place, to wrestle with the most complex and pressing issues in our world, and to create empathy and understanding. At a time when swirling around us is so much polarization and distrust, so many old wounds reopened, so many familiar ones that have never been dressed or redressed, so much uncertainty, pain, rage, longing, this gathering feels truly like a momentous and even miraculous occasion of profound convergence as amazing shapeshifters from around the world come together here in Washington to share different perspectives to discover all we have in common. So thank you very much for being part of it. The dream that led to tonight's gathering was sparked last summer when with our colleagues from the Global Theater Initiative, we hosted a convening here at Georgetown with uh, just over 200 people from more than 20 countries on the theme of finding home, migration, exile, and belonging as part of Theater Communications Group's, group's national conference. And among many memorable highlights of the day, one of the most moving was Josette Bichelle Mingo's vivid and inspiring account of her production of A Raisin in the Sun, the first major production of the classic play in Sweden. Some months before, both Cynthia and I on separate visits had been to Johannesburg to the legendary Market Theater and spent time with artistic director James Nkobo and learned, among other things, about the historic production of Hansberry's classic play he was staging there. And then, as it happens, our close collaborators and longtime partners here at Arena Stage in Washington were planning to produce the play in a major revival, which begins performances later this week. So this event stemmed from our collective wondering with the amazing Linda Zacherson, the cultural counselor from the Swedish Embassy, what it might mean to bring artists from the three productions together as a catalyst for deeper exploration. Um, and over these past couple of days and just watching the artists interact a little bit, I can say that reality has far exceeded our expectations. Um, our Global Theater Initiative with TCG also serves as the U.S. Center for the International Theater Institute, which under the umbrella of, of UNESCO is the world's largest performing arts organization, advancing UNESCO's goals of mutual understanding and peace, and advocating for the protection and promotion of cultural expression through centers in 90 countries spread over every continent in the world, 90 centers all over the world devoted to theater. Since 1962, three years after the premiere of Raisin, ITI has commemorated World Theater Day every March 27th, a celebration of the value and importance of the art form and, in ITI's words, quote, a wake-up call for governments, politicians, and institutions around the world which have not yet recognized its value to the people value of theater, that is. So it's meaningful that as we gather in force here in Washington, D.C., at a time when our new administration is working to eliminate government support for the humanities and the arts, and as steep and dire as many of the challenges are right now, it has been inspiring in these last few months to be on campus here at Georgetown, 
where the values that animate us, our colleagues, and our students feel like they are burning brighter and more urgently than ever. The pursuit of social justice, inquiry, imagination, freedom of expression, concern for the greater good. And we're seeing, I think, resistance and impact through the formation of new alignments and collaborations from people from different disciplines and sectors. Um, I have a fair number of people to thank, which I'm going to try to do quickly, but fervently. Um, uh, and I think that the number there are to thank, this is not a laundry list. It's really meaningful and indicative of exactly the power of what's here in this room, the range of partners and incredible convergence here. And there are many who I could thank, but I'm not going to, who are kind of part of that um, ripple effect, I feel. Um, but a huge thank you to Linda Zafferson, Stefan Hansen, as well as the ambassador and all of our colleagues at the Swedish Embassy, who've been our close collaborators in bringing this event to life. To our partners in the Global Theater Initiative with TCG, in particular, Amelia Cacciapero, Kevin Bitterman, and Teresa Eyring, with whom we've partnered to form GTI, which strengthens, nurtures, and promotes global citizenship and international collaboration in the US professional and educational theater field, trying to make the US theater less isolationist and more inclusive. To the extraordinarily brilliant and generous Joy Gresham, director of the Lorraine Hansby Literary T Trust, and her team, we'll hear from Joy shortly. To our partners at Arena Stage, with gratitude as ever for the generosity of Andrew Ammerman, who's made so many events possible through the Georgetown Arena Partnership. To Joel Hellman, Dean of Georgetown School of Foreign Service, for having the vision to see that storytelling, the arts, narrative, and empathy are essential pillars for one of the world's leading schools of international relations, especially in these times. It's rare that this kind of work is prioritized in that context, and we at the lab feel truly honored to be part of SFS, and also a huge thank you to the whole staff and team and support for, for helping make this our first major event um, as part of SFS possible. To our colleagues in the Department of Performing Arts here at Georgetown, which is my home, especially our amazingly generous uh, and brilliant chair, Soika Colbert, a leading expert on Hansbury and dramaturg of Arena Stage's current production, who will moderate tonight's discussion. I also want to thank Dean Chet Gillis from the college. His leadership and care for the performing arts has been so vital to my time here over the last decade. To the brilliant Kwame Kwe Arma, a giant of the global theater based right here in our region as artistic director of Baltimore Center Stage, where in 2013 he produced the celebrated Raisin Cycle with plays in rep inspired by Raisin in the Sun, including his own play, Beneath This Place. Kwame will give the World Theater Day address. Our friends from Mosaic Theater of DC, led by Ari Roth, who, as Convergence would have it, have uh, their own rep opening later this week of two plays from South Africa, South Africa Then and Now. And perhaps especially to and every one of the extraordinary artists from South Africa and Sweden for making this journey, for sharing themselves with us so generously and with each other, um, as well as the artists from the Arena Stage production, um, and a special nod to the other DC artists, uh, Erica Rose and Kenyatta Rogers, too. If you care about theater in DC at all, you know that these are two of the leading lights of our DC theater community. Uh, to Jamie Galoon, Vijay Matthew, and our partners at HowlRound, who are the reason why we are live streaming this event globally to the world, hello world. Uh, to Shivania Corbin Johnson for all her help. And lastly, I would be remiss not to acknowledge that this event and everything the lab does and undertakes would be entirely impossible without the superhuman efforts of our managing director and our only full-time staff member, Jojo Reed. In a particularly moving interview between Lorraine Hansberry and the legendary journalist and oral historian Studs Terkel from 1959, just after the premiere of Raisin, Hansberry said, quote, I sense at this particular time a new mood in the country. We've gone through 10 years of misery under McCarthy and all that nonsense. To the great credit of the American people, they got rid of it. 
and they're making new sounds. I'm glad I was here to make one. At the time, she was 29 years old, and she would live only five more years. But nearly six decades later, here we are, and that sound she made hasn't, in fact, dried up, but reverberates with immediacy in South Africa, Sweden, Washington, D.C., and sites around the globe. That sound conjures us to listen deeply to one another, to reflect on the past, to notice and bear witness to the present, to imagine the future and to forge new relationships that will strengthen that future. This way of coming together is a powerful antidote to the polarization, repression, xenophobia, and distrust around us. Theater can be spectacularly good at countering polarization through the empathy it enables in a live communal setting like this one. And it's really, uh, I'm really so thrilled that we're gonna be able to share this evening with you. I would ask you to turn your cell phones off uh, so that we're not interrupted by, uh, by anything unwelcome. And um, among the many distinguished guests I've mentioned, we're particularly honored tonight to be joined by the current ambassador of the Republic of South Africa to the United States of America, who will share a few words of welcome and some insight into the history and impact of uh, Johannesburg's legendary market theater. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Mininwa Malangu. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are very much honored as South African Embassy today to be part of this year's celebration of World Theater in partnership with our friends from Sweden and the United States. I say friends because my country could never have achieved its freedom without the support of these two nations. And I'm sure you all well read about the history and you understand well what I mean about that. Those who have not yet had a chance to do so, many books and many plays do demonstrate that you will understand as time goes on, what am I referring to? South Africa can never forget the political and financial support that was extended by Sweden to the anti-apartheid movement as one of the first countries in the West to support our struggle. Neither can we forget the support we received from American people that led to the adoption of the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act in 1986 which provided a, dear, a deadly blow to the, Africa, to the apartheid system. You would remember that amendment was called the Rangel Amendment. And that amendment has meant a lot to us and has made us what we are today. We are a free country. We are a democratic state today in South Africa and we belong to the globe like all of you today sitting in here. And that's a reason. And that's one of the reasons that why we collaborate, why we work with you, why we partner with you, because to us it's very important. Friends and brothers are there in need and in deed when we really and seriously need them. Neither can we forget the support also that we got from many of you sitting in this house in different forms. Many people around the world were not aware of what is happening in South Africa during those dark days of apartheid era. It took people like O. Artambo 
who we are commemorating his centenary this year and many others to be deployed around the world to communicate what was happening in South Africa. When many of us were oppressed in our own country and worstly, when we're silenced in our own country, it was the arts that played a major role in telling the story. Because when you're silenced, you couldn't tell the story. When you're threatened and you're under fear, you couldn't tell the story. But the art was able to perform that duty very expressly and clearly to the world, not just to a few. Places such as Market Theater played an important role in ensuring that the voices of silence were heard through performance. Most of the people around the world got to learn about what was happening in South Africa through commissioning work by the theater ending in the name of theater of the struggle, close quote. Ladies and gentlemen, this goes to show what a critical role theater plays in our society. And I believe the same to be true around the world. We face different challenges today. Around the world, and has been the case in the past. We will continue to look at the theater as one of the mediums to help us understand and unpack what is happening in our different societies. Many parts of the countries are still even silenced today, one way or other. But the theaters could unpack that and demonstrate it on the stage or platform as you will be doing tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, internationally, or international solidarity became one of the anchor pillars in our struggle to end apartheid because we were able to draw inspiration from others in the civil rights movement and many other formations fighting, or fighting for justice and equality around the world. As you know, all of you, that the political landscape and economic landscape changes from time to time, the theater will continue to play and raise those issues on the stage. I was therefore encouraged to learn about the collaboration effort to have to pioneer work of Lorraine Hansberry, a raisin in the sun, interpreted in three continental cross-cultural contexts. And that's how you speak to us, and that's how you speak to the world, and that's how you speak to all of us. It speaks to our need to come together as the people of the world to face our current challenges through collaboration effort. Simply because we're not islands, we cannot live alone. We are people of the world. For us to succeed and prosper, it is necessary to do what we are doing tonight. Cross-cultural speaking can make us a wonderful world to live in and can bring that unity that we need and make a wonderful living for all of us and create peace in the world. I therefore want to take this opportunity to thank all those involved in bringing us together here on this important occasion. Thank you. Mr. Ngovo, you are here with some of the South Africans. The Swedish people are here. The United States is here. Many others 
I have no words to say thank you tonight, but thank you very much. Let the evening go well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good evening, everyone. I'm Linda Sakrisan. I'm the cultural counselor of the Embassy of Sweden. <laughs> and I must say, I'm very, very touched. I was saying to Joy that I will cry a lot tonight, hopefully not while I'm speaking. <laughs> so please beware with me. But <clears throat> I think you might need some handkerchiefs uh, later tonight. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for, for your kind words. Um, <clears throat> um, as the cultural counselor uh, for the Embassy of Sweden, we're based uh, close by here in something called the House of Sweden by the waterfront of Georgetown. And I would like to invite all of you to come and see us there. We're open every weekend to the public. And uh, we have uh, events going on all the time. And me and my colleagues, we work all over the US, where we constantly try to work through the arts and in collaborations uh, with the arts. This year, we are focusing on migration. And Sweden, uh, in fact, welcomed more refugees than any other European country in relation to its population. We took in more than 200,000 refugees the last two years. Thank you. The equivalent figure in the US uh, would be six million people. This has created quite a debate also here in the US that we want to address in different ways from the embassy side. And uh, my background is with the arts. Before coming here almost two years ago, uh, I have 20 years of experience from uh, mostly with theater, but also uh, dance, circus, and film and cultural policies. And through our work, we, we are trying to find ways of uh, nuancing the debates. And right now we have two exhibitions on display on migration. Uh, one of them is called Sweden Beyond the Headlines. And the other one is a photo exhibition by a photographer called Magnus Venman, who followed children, refugee children, uh, and asked them of where they are sleeping. He has uh, taken uh, very, very strong photos. It's called Where the Children Sleeps. It's on display until June, and I think you should all see it. We all need to see it. Um, also, on the relationship between S Sweden and South Africa, I have to mention that the institution in Sweden where I spent most of my years, the City Theatre in Stockholm, Stadstheatern, and since 1991, that theater had a great relation and exchange going on with the market theater in Johannesburg that has contributed so much to the development and learning and understanding in, in Swedish theater and in the Swedish society too. So thank you for that. I believe in the power of performance and I believe in the power of conversation. And I really think that we can, through the arts, create nuances, plurality, and go beyond black and white, and beyond polarization. And uh, this experience, just as uh, Derek explained, has been a very organic one in an amazing way. It feels like in these troubling times, we are all eager, in an almost electric way, of taking a stand from the first crazy idea that came up when I approached the TCG in the New York offices one and a half year ago, suggesting that uh, we should invite Josep Buschel Mingo, 
uh, this magnificent director and actress from Sweden to come to the national conference here in DC. They were like, yes. And all the way through this process until today, and I think also for the future, everyone has jumped on board without knowing really how to make this happen, but just said, we have to do it. We have to do it. And when Josette came here, as Derek described, she came speaking at the pre-conference here for 200 people, and she was fearless. She was fearless in the exact way that the debate needs. She addressed all the hardest issues uh, with such an emotional maturity and, and competence, and it started a spark. And it kicked off new ideas and a thirst to move on, to think bigger, to dig deeper, and to investigate further. Uh, so thank you to all wonderful partners here in the US for believing in the idea of bringing the first Afro-Swedish ensemble ever to meet here with theater colleagues from the African diaspora from around the world to share experiences. And thank you also. Yeah. Thank you also to the Swedish Arts Council and the Swedish Arts Grants Committee for your support in making this happen. I think that nowhere else in the world is the importance of this event and this conversation larger than right here and right now. Thank you. Now it's time to start celebrating the World Theatre Day. <laughs> and I'd like you all to welcome the amazing Kwame Koyama on stage, please. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. That sounds like about five people out there. I'm gonna do it again. Good evening, everybody. Yes, we're here to celebrate World Theatre Day. What beautiful words they are. I, first of all, have to thank any and everyone who is responsible for asking me here today. What a beautiful honor. Um, what we do is a beautiful thing. At least it is to me. And to be able to speak to it for but a few minutes um, is, a, is really touching and humbling. The iconic American theater practitioner, Zelda Fitchhandler, once said, the gift of the artist is the gift of sight. For those of us whose primary area of expression is the theater, I might augment that by adding the gift or even the basic requirement of a theater artist is to think, no, to dream forward. Dream is a curious word, isn't it? It can carry the connotation of an unrealistic aspiration, of an intangible thing yet to be made manifest, of a beautiful desire experienced with eyes closed and bodies in liminal space. But to me, as a theater artist, dreaming is what we do all day, every day, with our eyes wide open and our feet firmly placed on the ground but we're not the only people who dream. The world is, well, is currently unsettling. But what's abundantly clear to me is that this is someone's dream. This is someone's desire made most manifest. The rise of populist nationalism across the West and some parts of Asia should not have been a surprise to those, as Fitch Handler says, who have the gift of sight. But it should, however, have been a huge wake-up call to those that dream forward. It prompted many questions in me. Somewhere along the line, did I, did we, dilute our dreams of a collective, inclusive world? Did we subconsciously think that our values were unrealistic aspirations to be experienced momentarily, only with our eyes closed? 
Did we simply not believe enough? I began to get a little depressed. And then I remembered that I am a theater artist. And here's the beautiful thing about theater. It is best experienced with our eyes fully open, best made with our fears and our questions and our wounds on full display. And it can only be constructed with the mutuality of absolute interdependence. Yes, individuality has no place here and there are no alternative facts to that. Theatre is a palace dedicated to and sanctified for the pursuit of truth, using the spirit and the mind and sight as its tools. At best, it pushes the soul into permanent action. We all know that because we all fight for that opening night, don't we? Now, do I sound a tad evangelical? Yes, I do. And why should I not be? I want everyone on this planet to partake in this art form in whatever way they can. Because ultimately, when I dream forward, I see a world that fully utilizes the power of communal narrative creation to help rehumanize our families, our cities, our countries, and our world. Theater ultimately rehumanizes the most powerful tool on the planet. No, that is not the internet. It is the human heart. And ultimately, we, as theater artists, are here to do just that. Make the human heart stronger, beat faster, see further and dream bigger. Happy World Theatre Day. Good evening. My name is Joy Gresham, and I am the literary executor to the estate of Lorraine Hansberry. I'm the daughter of Jewel Handy Gresham and Robert Nimeroff. Robert Nimeroff was Lorraine's creative collaborator and the person who she trusted most with her words and her thoughts. And Robert Nimeroff was named by Lorraine as her literary executor upon her death. In 1967, Robert Nimeroff married my mother, Jewel Handy Gresham, and I was her 10-year-old only child. At that time, we moved to the Croton on Hudson home, which was Lorraine and Bob's. I lost my father in 1991 to cancer. And in 2005, my mother followed him, also dying of cancer. It was at that time that I took the helm as literary trustee, and so my work began. Now, the work that I do as literary trustee is that I manage all the rights, I license all the print, audio, photographic, film, stage, and intellectual properties of this artist. Nothing can go to print, to stage, 
to uh, recording without coming through me. And I take this awesome responsibility very seriously and with tremendous humility. Lorraine is not often recognized for the breadth of her brilliance and her voice. She was a prolific essayist, speaker, and cultural critic. Now let me say a few words about A Raisin in the Sun. I was asked to speak to give you a broad context for understanding not only this work, but all the work of Lorraine Hansberry. A Raisin in the Sun had its Broadway premiere in 1959. The artist was 29 years old. A Raisin in the Sun is still in constant production. In fact, every day it's in production somewhere in the world. We've come to understand that A Raisin in the Sun is not just an American play, it's a play of the world. It's been translated into over 30 languages. It's been performed on six of the seven continents, the exception being Antarctica. As you may know, A Raisin in the Sun is part of the core curriculum in the United States and in Europe. 2009 marked the 50th anniversary of the Broadway premiere. And in 2004 and 2014, A Raisin in the Sun returned to Broadway. 2009 also marks the resurgence of interest in not only A Raisin in the Sun, but all of the Hansberry works. At the same time, in 2014, Lorraine's second play, The Sign in Sidney Brewstein's Window, was revived at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and then again in 2016 at the Goodman Theater in Chicago. It's now headed for Broadway. 2016, uh, Lorraine's third play, Les Blanc, was revived at the Royal National Theater in London to critical acclaim. 2016 also marks the Swedish touring production of A Raisin in the Sun and the South African production at Market Theater in Johannesburg. Today, World Theater Day marks the historic gathering of three companies from South Africa, Sweden, and the United States Arena Stage. Let me repeat, never before has this happened. All around the world, people are dreaming of home, better life, and migration. In closing, let me just place emphasis on a few statements. A Raisin in the Sun, in particular, of all Hansberry's work, has never gathered dust. Lorraine's work is more alive now than ever. We honor her legacy as artist, public intellectual, writer, and activist. Lorraine is of the future. Our job is to try and catch up with her. <laughs> to learn more about her life and work, I invite you to check out our website, LHLT, which stands for Lorraine Hansberry Literary Trust, it's LHLT.org. Thank you.
It's such an honor to be here to celebrate World Theater Day with you and specifically to do so in honoring Lorraine Hansberry. Um, so I'm just gonna take a moment to introduce Hansberry's um, beautiful play and then I'm going to invite the um, three theater companies, the three um, parts of our production to join me on the stage. Lorraine Hansberry's classic American drama is set on the south side of Chicago in 1959 and it depicts the dreaming of the younger family. The play begins with telling its audience that Walter, Big Walter has left an insurance check, he's just died and left an insurance check for the matriarch of the family, his wife, Lena Younger. And Mama, who she's referred to in the play, has to decide what she's going to do with this insurance money and how she's going to fulfill the competing and equally robust dreams of her children. Will she invest in the entrepreneurial desires of her son, Walter Lee? Will she help to support her daughter, Benita's dream of going to medical school? Or will she use the money to purchase a home for her grandson and her daughter-in-law, which is part of their shared dream? And so the play really takes us on a journey into how the younger family is able to use this money, but also how their dreams might be fulfilled working together and working in tension with one another. And so tonight we are going to have the awesome experience of seeing how Hansberry's beautiful work translates across three continents and how the dreaming that Hansberry invited us to participate in in 1959 continues to resonate with our current mo moment. So, at this time, I invite Josette and the rest of our actors to join me on stage. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up? Som en druva i solen. Kappa ekale ekarle kriva. De pishiga de moshagala. Eller får en liten karamell, en skorpa av något sött. Kanske blir det bara ett tungt ok som tynger ner allt mer. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a saw and then run? Jenge legese emnangati. Msaumbe isheka anga semva. Jengo mtualo onzima. Oh, does it explode? The first scene we are going to present today is from Act One, and it is when Mama and Ruth are sitting in the kitchen discussing what they could possibly do with the money. And it is in Swedish. Tio tusen dollar. Det är verkligen underbart. Tio tusen dollar. Vet du vad du borde göra, Miss Lina? Du borde åka iväg på en resa någonstans. Till Europa eller Sydamerika eller vad som helst. <laughs> Bevare mig väl. Jag menar allvar. Bara packa din väska och åk. Glöm familjen och ha det riktigt kul för en gångs skull här i livet. Du pratar som om jag snart skulle dö. Vem skulle följa med mig? Hur skulle det se ut om jag vandrar runt i Europa på egen hand? <laughs> du... De där rika vita kvinnorna, de gör det för jämnan. De tycker inte det är ett dugg konstigt att bara packa sina väskor och kliva ombord på en av de där stora oceanångarna och srisch så tar de iväg. Någonting säger mig att jag inte är någon rik vit kvinna. <laughs> Men vad ska du göra då? Ah, jag har inte riktigt bestämt mig. Men en del ska förstås gå till Benitas läkarutbildning och den delen får absolut inte röras. Absolut inte. Men sen har jag tänkt att vi, vi kanske skulle kunna klara av kostnaderna för ett litet tvåvåningshus någonstans med en trädgård. Om vi använder en del av försäkringspengarna till handpenning och alla liksom hjälps åt. Jag skulle kunna ta lite extra jobb igen. Ja, Gud ska veta att vi betalar tillräckligt med hyra för den här råttfällan att det hade räckt till fyra hus vid det här laget. <här> Rottfälla. Ja, det är allt vad det är. 
Men jag minns det som igår den dagen Begolter och jag flyttade in här. Vi hade inte varit gifta mer än 14 dagar och skulle inte bo här mer än ett år. Vi skulle lägga undan lite efterhand. Lite i sänder du vet och köpa ett hus där ute i Morgan Park. Vi hade till och med sett ut det. <laughs> Åh, du milde vad jag drömde om att köpa det där huset och göra det fint och ha en liten trädgård på baksidan. Så blev det aldrig någonting av det. Livet kan vara fullt av besvikelser ibland. Vet du, ibland brukade Big Walter komma in och slänga sig i den där soffan och bara titta på mattan och sen titta på mig och titta på mattan och sen titta på mig och då visste jag att han var nere. Verkligt nere. Och sen, Gud, när jag förlorade mitt lilla barn, lille Claude, då trodde jag nästan att jag skulle förlora Big Walter också. Och vad den mannen sörde sina barn. Det är ingenting som kan tära på en så mycket som att förlora ett barn. Jag antar att det var därför han till slut arbetade i sig som han gjorde. Som om han förde sitt egna privata krig mot den här världen som tog hans barn ifrån honom. Han var en fin man, Mr. Younger. <laughs> Tokig i sina barn. Men Gud ska veta att det var mycket som var fel med Walter Younger. Han kunde bli både tjuvskallig och elak och rätt vild med kvinnorna. Men han älskade verkligen sina barn. Han ville alltid att de skulle ha någonting och bli någonting. Det är därifrån Walter Lee får alla sina idéer ifrån antar jag. <laughs> Vet du? Ibland brukade Walter Lee säga att... Han kunde bli rätt blank i ögonen, han kunde luta huvudet tillbaka med ögonen fulla av tårar och säga Det verkar som att Gud inte tyckte att den svarte mannen skulle ha något annat än sina drömmar. Men han gav oss våra barn för att det skulle vara någon mening med de där drömmarna. Ja, han kunde prata på det där viset, vet du. Ja, visst kunde han det. Han var en bra man, Mr. Younger. Ja, en fin man. Han kom bara aldrig fatt sina drömmar och så var det bara. In this next scene, uh, oh, ah. Uh. Yes, thank you. Uh, um, I thought it was a different scene first. I'm going to sit back down again <laughs> and let this happen. <clears throat> this, uh, this next moment is now the money and the check, of course, have arrived, and there has been debate. The scene that we are going to see now is when uh, the money is lost and we see Benitha meeting Asagai to discuss. Walter has lost part of his money and the life of the family is changed. Aliyo. What kind of mood is this? Have I told you how deeply you move me? <laughs> he gave away the money, I start. Who gave away what money? Insurance money. My brother gave it away. He gave it away? He made an investment. Now the man even Travis wouldn't have trusted with his most worn out marbles. And it's gone? Gone. Oh, I'm very sorry. And, and you now? Me? Me, I'm nothing. Me. When I was very small, we used to take our sleds out in the wintertime. And the only uh, th th hills we had were the ice-covered snow steps of some houses down the street. We used to fill them in with snow and make them smooth and slide down them all day. It was dangerous, you know, far too steep. Sure enough, a kid named Rufus, he came down too fast, hit the sidewalk, and we saw his face split open right there in front of us. 
I remember looking at his bloody open face thinking that was the end of Rufus. But they, but the ambulance came and they took him to the hospital and fixed his broken bones and sewed him all up. And the next time I saw Rufus, he just had one line down the middle of his face. I never got over that. What? That. That that was what one person could do. Fix him up, sew up the problem, make him all right again. That was the most marvelous thing in the world. I wanted to do that. I always thought that was the one concrete thing that a human being could do. Fix up the sick, make them whole again. This was truly being God. You wanted to be God? No, no, I, I, I wanted a cure. It used to be important. I wanted a cure, it used to matter. I used to care. I mean about people and how their whole bodies hurt. And you have stopped caring? Yes, I, I, I think so. Why? Because it doesn't seem deep enough, close enough to what ails mankind. It was a child's way of seeing the world, an idealist. Children see all things very clearly sometimes, and idealists even better. I knew that's what you'd think. Because you're where I left off. You with all your talk and, and dreams of Africa. You still think you can patch up the world. You're the great sword of colonialism with your, your, your penicillin of independence. Yes. Independence and then what? What about the crooks and thieves and plain idiots who will come into power and steal and plunder the same as before? Only this time they'll be black and do it in the name of new independence. What about them? That will be a problem for another time, but first we must get there. And where, where does it end? End? Who spoke of an end? To life? To living? An end to misery, to stupidity. While I was sleeping in my bed, there were things happening in the world that directly concerned me. People went out and did things and changed my life. Don't you get it, Asagai? There is no real progress. There's just one large circle we march in around and around, each of us with our own little picture in front of us. Each of us with our own little mirage of what we think is the future. That is a mistake. What is? What you just said about the circle. You see, it isn't just a circle. It is simply a long line, as in geometry. You know, the one that reaches into infinity. And because we cannot see the end, we, we also cannot see how it changes. It is very odd, but those who, who see changes, those who dream, we call them idealists. And those who only see the circle, we call them realists. <laughs> it is very strange and amusing too, I think. You're almost religious. Yes. You see, I have the religion of doing what it is necessary in the world of worshiping man because he is so marvelous, you see. Man is foul, and the human race deserves misery. <laughs> you have become the religious one in the old sense. Already after such a small defeat, you are worshiping defeat. I worship the truth. And the truth is, people are small, puny, and selfish. Truth? Why is it that you despairing ones always think that only you have the truth? I never thought to see you like that. You. Your brother has made a small, stupid, childish mistake, and, and you are being grateful to him. You've already given up on the ailing, uh, ailing human race on account of it. You talk about what good is struggle. <laughs> what good is anything? Where are we all going and why are we even bothering? And you cannot answer that. I leave the answer. 
In my village, back at home, it takes an exceptional man to read a newspaper or whoever sees a book at all. I will go back to my village and much of what I will have to say will seem strange to the people of my village. But I will teach and work and things will happen softly, slowly and, and, and quickly. And then at times it will seem as nothing ever changes at all. But then again, the sudden dramatic events of history will, will leap into the future and then quiet again. Retrogression even. Guns, murder, revolution. And I at times even wonder if the quiet wasn't at all better than the hatred and death. But I, I will look about my village at the illiteracy, disease, ignorance, and I will not wander long. Perhaps, perhaps I will be a great man. Perhaps I will hold on to the substance of truth and find my way on the right course. And perhaps I will be butchered some night in my bed by the servants of empire. A martyr. And perhaps I will live long to be old, respected and esteemed in my nation. And perhaps I will hold office. And this is what I'm trying to say to you. Alio, perhaps the things I now believe for my, for my country will be wrong and outmoded. And I will not understand and do terrible things to have things my way and keep power. Don't you see that there will be young men and women, not soldiers then, but my own countrymen to, to then step out of the evening shadows and slit my then useless throat. That they, that they have always been there and always will be. And to even have such a thing as my own death be in advance. They who might, who might kill me even replenish me. Oh, as a guy, I know all that. Good. Then stop moaning and groaning and tell me what it is you plan to do. Do? I have a bit of a suggestion. What? That when it is all over, you come back home with me. Oh, I forgot at this moment you decide to be romantic. Oh, my dear, young, beautiful creature of the new world, I do not talk about across the city. I am talking about across the ocean. Home to Africa. Noko koronu oluvemi. So, in the next scene, we'll find uh, Walter Lee and Travis uh, in their living room. Uh, they are waiting for the insurance check to come, and uh, Walter Lee is talking about his dreams about the money. What is the Papa? Are you full? No, daddy ain't drunk. Daddy ain't never gonna be drunk again. Okay. Good after, Papa. So, son, son. I feel like talking to you tonight. On what door? Oh, about a lot of things. About you and what kind of man you're gonna be when you grow up. Son. Son, what do you wanna be? when you grow up. Khafar. A what? Man, that ain't nothing to want to be. Varför inte? Because, man, it ain't big enough. You know what I mean. Ja. Men då vet jag inte. Ibland så frågar mamma mig samma sak. Och när jag säger till henne att jag bara vill bli som du så säger hon att hon inte vill att jag ska bli det. <laughs> You know what, Travis, in seven years, you're going to be 17 years old. And things are going to be very different with us. And one day when you are 17, I will come home from the office. <laughs> no, but after tonight, your daddy is going to, there's going to be lots of offices. What do? What do you do tonight? 
And you wouldn't understand yet, son, but your daddy's going to make a transaction, a business transaction, a business transaction that's going to change our lives. That's how come one day when you're about 17, I'll come home and I'll be pretty tired. You know what I mean? From a long day of conferences and secretaries getting things wrong as they always do. Because <laughs> an executive's life is hell, man. And I'll pull up a car in the driveway. Just a plain black Chrysler with white walls. No, no, no. Plain black tires. More elegant. Rich people don't have to be flashy. They'll have to get something a little sportier for Ruth. Maybe a Cadillac convertible do her shopping in. <laughs> and I'll come up the stairs to the house, and the gardener will be clipping away at the hedges, and he'll say, good evening, Mr. Younger. And I'll say, hello, Jefferson. How you doing this evening? And I'll go inside, and Ruth will meet me at the door, and we'll kiss. And she'll take my arm, and we'll go upstairs to your Room. Till mitt rum. Your room. To see you sitting on the floor with the catalogs of all the great schools of America all around you. All the great schools of the world. And I'll say, all right, son, it's your 17th birthday. What is it you've decided? Just tell me where you want to go to school and you'll go. Just tell me what it is you want to be, and you'll be it. Whatever you want to be, yes, sir. You just name it, son, and I'll give you the world. next scene, we have Mr. Lidner coming through to the youngers to try to convince them not to move into the white neighborhood, Clybourne Park. This is the very same neighborhood where Mama bought a house with some of the money she received. Good on, Miss. Your second Mrs. Selena Junger. Uh, yes. That's my mother. Excuse me. R brother Ruth, there's a white man at the door. All right, come in, please. Thanks, Mika. Um, my mother isn't here just now. I is it business? Oh, for set of ease. I had a seat. Thank you. I'm Mrs. Younger's son. I look after most of her business matters. <clears throat> I had to call Lidner. Walter Younger. <clears throat> this is my wife and my sister. What uh, can we do for you, Mr. Linda? You, the assault you're coming from, Clyburn Park's Forbetrings Why don't you put your things on the couch? Why, why, why? I missed. Thanks, Mick. Also, some sack, they're coming from Clyburn Park's Forbetrings Forening. And they have come to our kennedom that you, in every case, your mother has bought a house on 406 Clyburn Street. That's right. Can you uh, care for something to drink? Ruth, get Mr. Linda a beer. Och det ska jag ta. Eller, eller jag menar, tack så hemskt mycket. <laughs> Men nej, tack. Lite kaffe kanske? Nej, tack. Ingenting alls. <laughs> ja, jag, jag, jag vet ju inte hur mycket ni vet om vår organisation. Är det en sån där områdesorganisation som är till för att ta hand om... Ja, ni vet. Sånt som skötsel av området och speciella projekt. Ja, och så har vi också något som vi kallar för vår kommitté för introduktion av nya grannar. Yes, and what do they do? Eh, we men som don't get abobant. Girl, let the man talk. Ja, yeah, så alltså, man skulle kunna kalla det en slags välkomstkommitté. Jag menar, de, eller vi, vi eller jag är ordförande, åker runt och träffar de nya människorna som ska flytta in i grannskapet och liksom tipsar dem om hur det går till där i Clyburn Park. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Ja, ja, ja. Uh -huh. Och så har vi också en kategori vi kallar speciella områdesproblem. Yes, and uh, what are some of those? Talk. Talk so much. I will gerne förklara detta på mitt eget sätt. Jag menar, jag vill förklara det på ett speciellt sätt. Go ahead. Ja, no. 
skulle ni vilja sitta på en stol istället? Ni ser inte ut att sitta så bekvämt. Nej, nej, nej tack. Det, det, det är bra som det är. Tack så mycket. Ja, för att komma till saken. Jag är säkert medveten, ja, ni är säkert medvetna om några av de incidenter som har skett när färgade flyttat in i vissa områden. Mm. No, eftersom vi har vad jag tror kan vara en unik typ av organisation i amerikanskt samhällsliv så beklagar vi inte bara sånt. Utan vi försöker göra någonting åt det. Vi känner, vi känner att de flesta problemen här i världen, när det kommer till kritan, de flesta problemen existerar bara för att folk inte sätter sig ner. Och tala med varandra. Där sa du ett sanningens ord, mesta. Ja, 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 precis. Ja, att vi inte anstränger oss tillräckligt att försöka förstå den andra mannens problem, den andres perspektiv. Ja, men så är det. Ja, och därför blev jag ombedd att komma hit idag och tala med er och se om vi inte kan hitta något sätt att komma fram till en lösning. Jag menar, vem som helst kan ju se att ni är en skötsam familj. Ja, hårt arbetande, hedligt folk. Det är jag säker på. Och naturligtvis så finns det alltid någon som är ute efter att utnyttja den som inte fattar. Mm. <laughs> What do you mean? Jo, du, du, du förstår. Vårt område. Det består av människor som har jobbat och legat i som 17 i många herrans år för att bygga upp det lilla området. Alltså, vi, vi är inte rika eller... Eller märkvärdiga människor. Bara hårt arbetande, heligt folk som inte har så värst mycket mer än de små hemmen och en dröm. Om ett slags samhälle som vi vill att våra barn ska växa upp i. Ja, jag vill absolut inte påstå att vi är perfekta. Nej, det finns mycket som är fel med vissa saker som vi vill ha på vårt sätt. Men vi måste ändå medge att en man, vad den har för åsikter, har rätt att ha området han lever i på ett visst sätt. Ja, och som det är nu. Så, så, så känner en överväldigande majoritet av oss där borta att man kommer mycket bättre överens. Man hyser ett större intresse för livet i tillvaron när man delar samma bakgrund. Och nu vill jag att ni ska tro mig när jag försäkrar att rasfördomar helt enkelt inte har med detta att göra. Vad jag trying to say här I, I think it's. I, I believe that the black families will be much more happier if they live in their own communities. <laughs> This, friends, is the welcoming committee. Grab some chairs. Yes. <laughs> Do a circle here. I need five chairs here. I need two. And you will then get chairs for yourself to sit close to us. There you go. Come and sit close to the fire. You can place the mics in here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful.
So I just have a few questions of our um, directors about their respective productions, and then hopefully we'll loop into the conversation about what we just saw. So James, could you um, tell us a little bit about how the play, and specifically we could think some about the scene with Asagai and Benitha, how the um, politics and political possibility that the play dreams continues to resonate, and how that um, manifested itself particularly in South Africa when the play was performed on the 40th anniversary of um, Soweto Day, the Soweto Uprising. Well, um, <clears throat> first of all, um, Erika was right, the scenes were the other way around, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, 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 we looked at the production of um, um, A Raisin in the Sun for the Market Theatre celebrating its 40 years, and it was um, our seminal work for, for, for 2016. And this scene, uh, um, um, why we, we chose this scene to bring it here, um, it's because it was just a scene that is dealing with two young people dissecting their dreams, dissecting um, their path, you know, going forward. And, and, and for me, what was quite exciting, I spoke about it last night, is saying, um, to see a character like Asagai in South Africa, where since 1994 and our country went through a complete metamorphosis, we started seeing an influx of a, a whole lot of people coming to South Africa. It was very important that we looked at Asakai and um, in the play he speaks a lot of Yoruba because I wanted to make sure that in the scene the, the language Yoruba is, is, is heard by South Africans because if you remember for a long time we lived on our own, you know, during the apartheid years we, uh, and, 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 and there was a time in, in, in South Africa where there was sort of like um, 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 a xenophobic kind of um, episodes that were happening and it was very important to to um, to make sure that our audiences are able to see a, a, a character of a Nigerian that is not a, a, a stereotype of of, of um, a, a, a person involved in drugs and 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 and, and, and which is which is which is um, what was one of the the, the genesis that started um, this animosity that was that's been happening in South Africa between uh, um, um, you know some South Africans and, and, and Nigerians. And so we spend a lot of time really wanting to bring out this man, to bring out a, 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 a young dreamer. And I love the fact that at that time, Lorraine Hansbury brings out a, a, a character like Asagai in this play when, when countries like Ghana was, were, were, um, were, were getting their freedom and, and Algeria. And, and it speaks so much about how well read she was about the continent. Of, of of Africa and and I I didn't want to 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 go through what we've seen a, a, a lot where Nigerian characters are very exotic. I mean, I even said yesterday in the play he is he he we, we didn't even put him on Nigerian garb. He just arrived as a young man who's in Chicago studying and and there's this beautiful boy meet girl story that is happening between him and and and, and Benita and so. I, I I wanted to texture that in 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 a way that speaks to um, what is happening in South Africa in contemporary times, where um, 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 we, we 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 are seeing um, um, the continent uh, um, um, and it's a joyful time in, in in South Africa. So so these the the the, the relationship between Asagai and and Benita, we, we we really spend a lot of time to just to to blow it up and make sure that it is a. Um, 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 a joyful presentation for an audience. Thank you, thank you. So Josette, um, could you t talk some about what specifically resonated most with Swedish audiences from your production? We talked some about um, Hansberry's play opening up for us ways of dreaming new worlds, which is the theme of our theater here at Georgetown last year, but also something that came up in the conversation just now was about how Hansberry is really responding to what she saw as the politics of despair in mid-century, and one might argue that we are in a similar moment or a similar moment of peril um, internationally and specifically in the U.S., and so I'm just curious if there was a way that you saw the play responding in this moment to some of those national feelings that seem to be reemerging and might feel similar to what we were experiencing mid-century, both nationally and internationally. 
Okay, uh, what's rather ironic is that I've, I am British born and I live in Sweden, uh, working at Riksteatern. So I have multi languages, <laughs> so uh, don't get confused. I think um, one of the things that's very important is to understand the conditions under which uh, Afro Swedish actors are living and working. What's very important is that I detect for the first time over half of the audience saw a Raisin in the Sun performed by Afro Swedish actors part of our diaspora family in Swedish. This is not a language adopted. That you are Afro-Swedes. Tala du svenska, right? <laughs> it's not a joke, it's true, it's real. And I think the play resonated through Lorraine because here there was a great identification with family. There was a great identification with the female roles. We saw that both with our colleagues from South Africa in the performances that we saw at the wonderful Arena Theater, the mother figure, that role coming through. I think also as well in Sweden, we're in a position where um, we as yet have no um, black theater company. We as yet have not a strong enough, if an existing at all, um, books from the African diaspora. When we started the rehearsals, there were actors within it that didn't know or hadn't heard of Lorraine Hansbury. We did the play for the first time in 2016. In terms of the international resonance, it landed for us also at a backdrop when we had some of the most complicated political situations, almost a renaissance for Afro-Swedes, which was everything from the growth of the right wing within Europe and beyond, um, the reawakening of Afro-Swedes to their um, uh, the community of Sami, which are, of course, uh, Sweden's uh, first indigenous uh, population, and Sweden understanding its role within the slave trade, understanding that it also owns slave castles. A huge complication and awakening, awakening is maybe the wrong word, but um, a re-emergence of thought. So a raisin in the sun was working on multi-levels. Um, I used an image today, you know when you're choosing um, paint and you have this kind of um, fan of colors. You know what I mean? Um, it was a similar thing happening for us in Sweden. This just wasn't about the power of Lorraine Hansbury, which is what all this work was about. It was actually the fact that Sweden had never seen her work before. It had never been translated before. Her brothers and sisters, James Baldwin, Marcus Gardley, um, and all the great writers that exist in her house had never been heard of. It was the establishment of three-dimensional, complex characters living an everyday life in front of audiences. It was lifting her work up with some of the male patriarchal systems that were already in existence in Sweden. Ibsen, Chekhov, Strindberg, and there was Lorraine <laughs> coming forth and going, catch up with me, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> catch up with me. Um, in terms of the international perspective, it was then happening on a multi-layered, uh, which only the actors themselves can really explain. Um, and yes, it was about timing. It really was about timing. And of course, the political movement, whether we're looking at what's happening around Brexit, what's happening with the new government here, what's happening with the political growth within Sweden, a raisin in the sun landed right on time right on time for us in Sweden, on all sorts of levels. And so I'm picking up on the question of temporality um, and timing and riffing on um, Joy Gresham's um, note to us that Lorraine Hansberry is of the future. One of the things that you did in your cycle was imagine a future for Benita um, and some of the characters in A Raisin. And so I'm wondering if you were to think about an addendum to the play that would account for where we are today in our world and our politics, what would that be? And thinking about the ongoing impact of Raisin um, in 2017. I think that's quite hard to answer. <laughs> um, and, and the reason I think that's quite hard to answer is because I, I think my esteemed colleagues have, have kind of said and have articulated rather beautifully what, how, and, and joy, how much of a future seer Lorraine was. I'm fascinated. When I was writing Beneath His Place, I was fascinated how, and again, as my colleague has said, how after Ghana had only been independent for three years, that, that, that Lorraine was writing about the horrors that would 
be beset upon the continent, not just from the inside, but also from the outside in terms of international pressure to, uh, to, to break the dream of a Pan-Africa. And, and let me take this moment to congratulate Josette as well with bringing the diasporic family together so beautifully um, here this evening. It, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I think Clybourne Park was an attempt to bring this this beautiful narrative um, and this this quintessential American but yet universal story um, into the future. And so again, I, I'm, I'm slightly saying I don't know how to answer your question about what it would be. I think art is at its best when it lives in metaphor. Mm. So I'm I'm often actually I think it's she has done the future proofing. Lorraine, in the very in the very texture and and theme and construction of the play, um, anything else or anybody else is simply piggybacking on I think something which is very solid. Amazing. So I wonder if I could open up a question to anyone on stage who might want to answer, um, and we can pass the mics around about what the experience was like, both in production. Um, and in rehearsals for the arena stage folks for the play, and then also tonight being in collaboration or conversation via um, a diasporic audience, what that experience has been like. Uh, hi. Uh, I would say that the experience for me as an, uh, one of the first, I think, Afro-Swedes growing up as one of maybe 20 kids in the 60s in Stockholm, uh, growing up not even knowing about Lorraine Hansberry. Uh, this journey has been exceptional because it has also awakened a lot for me uh, as a person, but also as an actor. Uh, it has awakened an awareness, and nowadays I'd like to call myself an activist. Uh, it is more important, uh, my eyes are opened, and it's really important to do the work. Uh, I didn't know that before this. I really didn't. Uh, so I think that uh, a lot of us as Afro-Swedes will be changed forever. Uh, and watching the Swedish audience um, crying, laughing, recognizing even a little bit uh, ashamed of what they didn't do, what they couldn't do, and what they did. Uh, so for me, that was exceptional touring in 48 different cities in Sweden and meeting the audience and every night getting very, very strong reactions. Yes, can I speak? <laughs> yeah, it it was uh, was an emotional journey for many of us. For an example, we had to talk about protection uh, going out on tour because we don't know if we're gonna what can happen uh, because uh, it has happened before that the theater companies has been attacked and things happen on stage and stuff and in many. Uh, people got a bit scared and nervous, but uh, nothing happened, and, and the tour went. It was a beautiful tour in many ways. And for me, personal, uh, growing up as an Afro-Swede with uh, one parent from um, Senegal, West Africa, and uh, one Swedish parent, it was um, amazing to... Um, uh, it was not like 10 kids in Stockholm when I grew up, but uh, we increased. Yeah, uh, but it was still in the beginning like my father told me to say hello to all black people you see because we are family. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, <laughs> it's not really like that anymore. And I don't say hello to all the black people I see because then I will look <laughs> a bit strange. But I'm so happy to be, uh, of course, I've never been in a black cast before because normally you are the cast black person. Uh, and you, as some of our colleagues said before, you don't know why. I, is it because uh, 
it's gonna you're gonna put some flavor in it or is it because uh, <laughs> yeah you know what I mean so uh, to <laughs> to play diverse characters uh, and really feel like wow I I'm an actor and I'm doing this it was uh, yeah I'm very proud proud to be a part of this yeah thank you was both in terms of being in the production but then also being a part of this. Of this. Yes, oh. yes. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've had such an amazing time. I had no idea what to expect at Stand Up. Yeah, <laughs> um, I've had such an amazing time. I'm just so thankful, one. Um, it, it's just been beautiful and I wish we had all day. I wish we had all week uh, and I hope that one day we can continue this work. Um, anyway, so uh, it was uh, incredible to hear actors from Sweden um, uh, and South Africa talk about things that are happening here. Um, and it was uh, crazy to see that uh, also they were surprised by some things that they thought had changed here but hadn't. Um, I, told, I was saying today that um, uh, in, in my university experience, I, you know, we did all the classics, uh, Western white European classics, mostly male. Um, and I didn't do my first um, uh, all-black cast, uh, you know, African-American playwright until I was 26. I was out of school. So I was feeling like, um, you know, uh, I cannot do this, this language. Does this look like it's me? Is it mine? Because I didn't work on that in school. I didn't work on just being myself, you know? Um, right? So, um, uh, so it was very, very interesting to hear how um, the, the idea about not being black enough, I, w one person said that today. Anyway, uh, but just all those things, all those similarities, um, it's just, it feels so um, healing to hear. And I just wish we could keep talking, yeah. Um, I think for, for me, the experience doing A Raisin in the Sun was phenomenal because it was the ability to showcase the talent that we have as black South African performers, taking on the American accent and really immersing ourselves into the reality of a narrative that extends itself beyond our continent and giving it a truth. Um, we shared so much today about our experiences, and one of the things that I think was, uh, we for I, I forgot to mention, and would love to mention, is how in our cast, we had younger actors playing the role, so we didn't really go age-specific, as, you know, the script says. And what, what ended up happening was that so many of the black actors completely understood this reality of moving from a black suburb into a suburb that is considered, that is white, because a lot of us had grown up during just, you know, late 80s and some of, late 80s into the 90s, some of us, you know, um, 80s, you know, late 70s, 80s. Um, and so it was, a w through doing this work, or doing A Raisin in the Sun in South Africa, we found a way to express that experience, to get inside it and go, we know this so well. It happened, you know, it, it, it was a thing to, l to move from the township in South Africa and then go into the white suburb. Will, are you safe? Are you okay? Are you welcome? And a lot of the time, people weren't welcome. You know, um, and I think today's the, the, today's experience was absolutely phenomenal to know that Afro Swedes, Afro Americans, we all have we all have something that we share. It's the black life, you know. Um, so it's it's been an amazing opportunity and experience. I think one of the things that I, I, I often wrestle with, particularly with Lorraine Hansberry's work, is, um, 
is my perception, and I don't even perceive it to be right, that she understood that black was a political construction and that it really doesn't exist and that by being culturally specific, that somehow she could tap into the universal. That, that it, it, it felt less important to investigate blackness than it was to investigate the structural inequalities of a country and of a system that used race in a political way to suppress. And when I listen to the diasporic voice speak about that, I understand it, particularly when I hear it through a South African context. I hear structural inequalities through the construction of white supremacy. Less about extolling the virtues of blackness. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to share that. <laughs> So I know we're running short on time, and I want to leave time for you to ask questions, but I just have one more question of our directors, and that is um, about specific choices that you made um, to emphasize the context in which you were producing the plays, and so specifically thinking about casting Travis as an older character or any other um, decisions that you made in casting or in the production of the play that sought to emphasize the context in which you were producing it. Okay, I'll start because it's probably the easiest. We came to the production and there were two choices. Because we work at the Riksteatern, which is the National Touring Theatre, and we toured to over how many theatres? 48 theatres across the country. Um, that also meant, and we have Lotta Nielsen, if you want to stand up and wave quickly. There. <laughs> There's Lotta Nielsen from Sweden who designed it, and Eva Ritzel who dealt uh, with... Uh, um, the hair and the makeup. You also rise, Your Highness. Thank you. There you go. Right. Because they are the first. Um, but one of the things we noticed uh, very uh, quickly was um, we couldn't tour and we couldn't tour a child. Both of the productions that we have now saw today were in one place. Touring all over Sweden was legally not possible because we have to change the child, parent guidance, and so on. So in discussion with Joy, in discussion with Lisbeth Grönlund, who's here, who also did the first translation ever for us in Sweden, we were allowed to actually lift your hand, Elizabeth, say hi to everybody. <laughs> there you go. We actually then, and we found that, of course, that our colleagues in the market theatre did a similar choice, but then Travis became older, and that was then played by Adam, which, of course, I won't reveal how old you are, but... All this, needless to say, we were then able to tour. So that was one choice. One of the other things that came up, which I, I just want to end with, was, of course, I spoke a little bit about the political times, and there were many more things. In Sweden, we're still talking about Tintin i Kongo, which is the Tintin books, uh, and whether or not they should be in libraries. We're still um, discussing words to be used from the word, from the N word to, and the ownership of that to the Negro, Negress. We're still in, in that uh, context. And by the time we came out with the production, uh, the United States had gone through a whole series of brutal, brutal uh, murders, I would use that word, of uh, um, African Americans, uh, including uh, Michael Brown, um, and so on the list. When I call their names, I, if they come into the room, so I, I, I call them uh, with respect. But there was a whole summer of um, loss for us. And in that context, when we were doing um, the last scene of the play, uh, and Joy, you must correct me on this, of course, but uh, Lorraine wrote two versions. Uh, there was one version, which is the one that's most well-known, which is the family at the end, uh, when they've actually won the battle to get the house that they want and move to where they want to move to. Um, that extraordinary image where the plant is lifted and they leave the house and they're on their way. As I understood, uh, Lorraine wrote a second ending that through various choices from TV to length of time, all sorts of things. The second ending was actually one where the family were then, once the lights shifted and the family went out of the house, the next scene was actually when they arrived in their new house. And you saw them sitting under a lamp on the sofa. In Sweden, we tested that ending. 
The other ending that Lorraine wrote was also an ending that I would like to call Defending the Dream, <laughs> which is where she allowed um, the family, once they entered into the house, they experienced, um, and of course it was in Glyndebourne Park, which of course is a white area at that time. And when we staged it, the choice we made was the family arrived, and Travis, the son, comes into the house, and already outside there is uh, the sound of rioting because they already knew when Mr. Lidner goes back that there was going to be trouble. What was interesting for us was the choice. I didn't make the choice to do that scene. We actually presented it to our audience in Sweden. So we literally tested it in front of them and said, which one should we do in the context of Sweden? Should it be the one, and neither is good or bad, right or wrong, but which one? And in the end, uh, we did one scene where we set it up, we put all the lights, the sound, everything, and we explained to the audience, they came out, they did the scene, and people, it was, it, I mean, it's so, so powerful. Then we stopped, went back and did the second scene. And what was interesting in the second scene, the family come in, Travis came in, and he has a baseball bat in his hand, which he has as a plaything. But of course, with the sound of the riot outside, and of course, the residents in Kleinborn Park already beginning to a attack the family and the house, that bat that Walter takes from his son becomes a, um, a tool of defense. Does that make sense? So he takes it. Now what was crucial in Sweden was to ask the audience, which one should we do? Which ending was right for us now? And um, they chose the baseball bat. And they chose that specifically for where we were and still are at that time. The difference between what happened when the bat held as a toy of innocence and joy is transformed into a tool of defense because when as blacks we take anything in our hand, we are always on the attack. Somebody has yet to work out that we're actually defending ourselves a lot of the time. Sorry, I have to just slip that. Mm? But <laughs> the choice we made was to go with the baseball bat. And the final scene that we had is of the father taking the bat from his son, holding it to say, we don't want to do this, but if we have to, we will, and I will do anything to protect my family. Uh, we then played the voice of Mahalia Jackson as well, just to float her in, and we had permission to also weave in some of the original voice of Lorraine Hansbury, speaking at the end. Um, and most importantly, in terms of journey, we kept the final image moving. That meant that the actors were never frozen. They kept moving all the time, as if it would never end. That was a choice, and it was made democratically in Sweden by the people. <laughs> well, we had the same thing, uh, um, because we, we knew we, we wanted to, uh, uh, to tour the piece. Uh, um, we were looking at theaters in Cape Town, so we also had an older Travis. But one of the things that I wanted to do to the play I, at the market theater, we've got these arches and these alcoves, and I had an idea to create neighbors of the younger family that throughout the piece that were completely synchronized into the piece that, um, 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 I, 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 and right at the end, our ending was, the, the ending as you know it, where she picks up the plant, she exits, and then the next thing that happens, the whole set comes down and you see the, 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 the people who are sort of left behind, you know, and, and the youngers have been able to, to escape the squalor and the degradation of um, the area that they live in. Because for me also, it just comes from, uh, uh, again, I wanted it to resonate to what is happening in, 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 in South Africa, um, that today we still have people who've been just waiting for their dreams to to come right, and they still, they still waiting. And I just thought that kind of um, um, symbolism in the piece, that 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 we are showing these silhouetted characters to the audience throughout the piece, and then right at the end, as they exit, we then expose all these other people that are left behind. I worked with with a choreographer, so to make sure that 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 these these other lives that are in the play did not did not um, impact on the piece in, 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 in any funny way. And then looking also, going back to uh, um, Asagai, what I love that, that Lorraine Hensby did 
in the piece is that 50 years ago, the character of Asagai is projecting. And there's a scene, in that scene, he keeps saying, perhaps there'll be this, perhaps there'll be that. And I started thinking of um, General Abache, General Babangita, the death of Ken Sarawiwa. And in the beginning of this scene, as he walks in, I had this, 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 this Quran that was animated and it opens up and you see the two AK-47s, you're hearing the voice of an imam. And, and I wanted to, 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 to look at what is happening in Nigeria now. And the Ken Sarawiwa thing for me stood very strong because, you know, how he questioned what was happening in the Delta and he died for that. And there, there, were, there was something about us a guy that, 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 that spoke to, to the young people from Nigeria that went out of Nigeria to go and study and they went back home and there were animosities that were, that, that started happening and, and with, with, with some of the despots that were, that were running in the country. And, and, and so I, I, I was saying us who live today have experienced what he is, he is, he is, 50 years ago, thinking are uh, scenarios that, that might ha um, um, happen in the country. And we had, um, right at the beginning of the piece, the voice, I've just forgotten his name, of a first black DJ that was in Chicago that we used to, to, to open the piece. And, 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 uh, um, um, and um, uh, um, we, uh, I worked with a lady called Iris Dawn Parker from, from Chicago just to get the authenticity of, of, of um, of these characters, and and she was able to uh, um, um, her contribution to to uh, to our work, you know, and the, the kind of research that that was done, and um, and 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 for me, it was that we are doing raising the sun in 2016 in South Africa, but there has to be a thing, the, a stamp that says we are aware of what is happening on the continent, and how do we bring it into the peace without 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 messing up the piece and it was done with a lot of respect and a lot of humility to um um to what to what Lorraine Hansby uh, um, um, wrote and just one more thing that I wanted to say is is when you hear that even a theater like the market this was the first time that that a raisin in the sun was staged tells you that that there's a whole lot of writers that were never staged in South Africa. I said last night that we did a lot of Bennett Shaw. We did, we've done Mamet, Sam Shepard, uh, um, 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 all these American writers. But we've been now staging at the market. We've staged. I've directed James Baldwin's Amen Corner. I've done George C. Wolfe's um, uh, uh, um, um, the Colored Museum, and um, I've just directed um, Jeff Stetson's The Meeting. And we did this piece. And we're putting these works on the palettes of our patrons. And they are absolutely enjoying them. And, and, and in one interview, a radio person said to me, are you going to adapt the piece? And they were talking about uh, um, uh, um, the Colored Museum. I said, I can't adapt it. It's, it's, it's set in America. Where, where else can it set it? It's a satire on slavery. And, but that was a person who is not used to this kind of tapestry that I feel as an artistic director of the market that we can't be nostalgic about the market. As, and the market theater as a theater needs to move on. And moving on talks to how we get to curate these works and, and create a visibility of writers that, that our audience are not used to seeing. So we have time for questions. If anyone in the audience has a question, you can um, join us at the microphone in the middle of the aisle here. As I tell my students, we also take um, words of encouragement and comments too. My name is Dominique Lallemand, I'm French, <laughs> but I want to thank you very much, all of you. Uh, tak, <laughs> my only word of Swedish. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's extremely exciting what you are doing, and I'd like to come back to the question of universality of the theme in the play. And I was uh, wondering, looking into the future, whether you would see producing this play with people from 
very um, many more different origins, both in terms of races, nationality, ethnicity, potentially languages. Thank you. Uh, okay, I actually don't think that's a question for me. I think that's a question for Joy. Merci, madame. Uh, in terms of the play going on elsewhere, it already has. Uh, as I understood, uh, Ukraine was one of the places to deliver the play. Is that right? Well, as I said, um, the play has been translated into over 30 languages, this one play, which means it's, it has entered into the, those culture. We understand that, right? So that's automatically, by taking it into the language, you take it into the cultural experience. That transforms it. By transforming, I mean it grounds the story in its universality. Um, Lorraine had a very uh, strong law, <laughs> for lack of a better word, that this play was founded, it was really based in its universality, but at the same time, it was never to be a product of blackface. It was never to be um, taken out of the black experience, out of the south side of Chicago, out of the American experience. And so uh, that's something that I have, to, I, I have to abide by. I can't allow it to be changed in any kind of way. I know that there have been requests in the past to, uh, to for casting reasons, work around um, how the play is set up. I was contacted um, at, on my watch as literary executor, I was contacted for permission for the Royal Theatre, the National Theatre of Australia to produce the play and to, um, instead of working with the, uh, with the black family because of casting challenges to make some of the characters, white Australians. <clears throat> and um, was I open to this? I said, absolutely not. I said, you have an extraordinary opportunity with an Aboriginal population. <laughs> and I would suggest <laughs> that you think about that. <laughs> and I never heard from them again. <laughs> but that was as much of a challenge for me as it was for them, I believe, uh, because I really, uh, I really needed to think about that. But one of the uh, one of the adaptations that I granted uh, several years ago. I was approached by a company from Nepal who wanted to translate the play into Sanskrit. And uh, we talked over some time. They wanted to keep the play as is, um, only that Nepalese actors would perform, but they would still be the youngers from the south side of Chicago. <laughs> I spoke to them at length and felt comfortable with it and granted permission. I asked that they please send me a copy of the script when it was published. They sent me this beautiful book. It's just this beautiful book. I opened it and there are photographs of the book of the younger family, but in Nepali style. And it just broke my heart. It was so beautiful. So I think there's the opportunity for us to enter into the experience in a legit way, and at the same time to honor um, that all the universality that's needed, Hansberry has written. Uh, it's all there. Thank 
First, it's um, a pleasure to be here to experience this, and I want to thank the person that invited me. Uh, my name is Deborah Watts, and um, I'm the cousin of Emmett Till. And I'm here um, in this city to address some very uh, key issues related to progression and things going forward. Uh, meeting tomorrow with the Attorney General uh, to talk about the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crimes Act and bill that is law. But let me just say that the presence of Mamie Till Mobley, Emmett Till, as you call the name of, of uh, Mike Brown and others, is here. And the truths that you all represented tonight uh, is the universal nature of our dilemma. And that is that we need to unite somehow. And with the different languages, it was just a beautiful um, canvas of what we need to be. And so I thank Lorraine um, in her youthfulness and in her deep nature of trying to address a painful time. She was part of the Emmett Till generation. And so I can see themes of, of that pain and, and what she was experiencing and how it impacted the lives of many artists during them. And I know that Emmett's, um, the presence and the spirit is part of it. So even though um, you never said it or whatever, I felt it. And I'll just say it's deep and you continue to do what you're doing because uh, this is very important. So I appreciate your opening eyes, your opening hearts, and that is exactly what we need done. So thank you very much for all of you and your support. Thank you. Hi, my name is Benjamin Lillian. I'm a junior in the college at Georgetown. And I want to thank you uh, first for a phenomenal performance tonight. You showed us the power that theater can have to inspire people to do things. Um, and this question goes to all of the directors and all, everyone on stage, but it might be more relevant for the um, Afro-Swedish company touring here. I, sorry. Um, how, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how you had the audition processes and casting and drew from a well of black act, of a black actor community in Sweden, um, because personally, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, theater active, active. Sorry, there are a lot of students here who are active in theater on campus, and a big problem we have is incorporating diversity in our student productions. And I was wondering if you could speak at all how you overcame that challenge in developing a uh, all-black cast for this production. Okay, and, and of course, everyone else that was there in Sweden. Um, when um, we started the casting, one of the first things I did was that it was open. There wasn't, I wasn't choosing people in that way. Um, the second thing is that um, I auditioned approximately 47 Afro-Swedish actors, and no more. There weren't any. Then the choice was to be, uh, because they aren't there yet. They're not, they're coming. I mean, I'm telling you, even as I speak, that has changed. I think, um, I think what you brought up, Joe, was very important, that it was not going to be cast in any other way than is written. That was a gone. There was only going to be an Afro-Swedish ensemble doing that. And I was prepared to go out beyond. So, for example, Kaya is one of the most well-known uh, musical theater actresses we have in Sweden, known for your albums, Eurovision. That's her background. <laughs> oh, it's true. It's true. Um, so, thanks to Lorraine, I pushed the boat out and I looked in other ways. Our Benita uh, was an extremely talented musical composer who came and sang on that day. She was so scared, I stopped her so that she could start again because she hadn't done anything quite like this before. Um, Lorraine forced us to keep going and not give up and go for the nearest. Um, also, when it came to uh, the roles of Asagai, et cetera, et cetera, we went as far out as we could, going beyond the pool of trained actors as well. Then there's availability and who is available, but that's the list that I have. I still have the file at home with all of those actors in it. 
for me, um, it was never going to be any other way. I was never going to do anything else. Um, and for us in Sweden, I think the, um, the chance to uh, do the piece just in the principle of this was going to be, except for one principal character, an all Afro-Swedish production pulled people out in a way that I hadn't expected. Um, and although 47 sounds little, in terms of the overall, it was maybe 50 or 60 CVs in the end that m when we pulled it together, but we had men apply for it, we had white guys apply for it, we had white women apply for the roles, and we sent those back and said, no, we will keep going uh, uh, on, on this. So the casting of it really was to listen to it. And in Sweden, anything else you wanted to add to the casting about it? It was hell. <laughs> it, was a, it was a callback as well. It wasn't uh, just, you know, well, I've got you now, I've got you. This was actually a callback and going through it um, and putting your foot down and going, it will be like this because this play demands it. Lorraine's play demands it and we will keep going until we find the person. And we will not sit and justify why it needs to be like that, neither the play nor the casting of it. And that was a very interesting and how can we say um, ah, flavorsome relationship <laughs> with the whole theater. There wasn't resistance, but there was definitely, how is this going to work? I said, trust me. We need to catch up. It will work. So that's how we dealt with it. But the Swedish context is very different in terms of theatre schools, in terms of the applications into theatre schools, the encouragement, the types of plays that are coming out uh, now in terms of classical work in Sweden. Uh, after Raisin in the Sun, Druvan is Solen. So that's an answer to it, and of course I'm working to make sure it's not the last one. So that's how we kind of dealt with it. I don't think there's, did you want to add any? I'd like to understand what, so what do you mean the problem is in terms of finding, working on the diversity here? No. So that was um, uh, within student productions, student companies, a big thing that we are talking between. So there are f um, five main student um, companies on campus. Um, other people in here will speak more to that. Uh, if they are, can all the students who are active in theater right here raise their hand maybe, show that we are very active. Um, Stand up. Please. So just a topic that has been on um, through all of our uh, on our listservs and our emails and on our brochures that and our forums between us is trying to incorporate the because we recognize that there's a problem of diversity in um, one just uh, just uh, student population, but also then in terms of active activity in theater, um, and that is something that we we're trying to try and address in our productions and people involved both on stage and backstage um, in the grander scheme. Well, uh, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know Georgetown very well, but I, I do know that when I was in school, um, I went to Morehouse College. Um, so, I mean, obviously, it w <laughs> thank you. Um, obviously, obviously, there wasn't a problem with finding black actors. Um, <laughs> but I will say that you know, I, I mean, without going into what kind of project specifically you all, you all are trying to put on, which might have a little bit to do with it, um, I know for a fact that some of the best actors that ended up on that stage weren't majors. Um, I, th there's a guy uh, that I graduated with, Brian Tyree Henry. He's uh, on the show Atlanta right now. He was on Broadway in, um, whatchamacallit, uh, the South Park Guy show. Um, <laughs> Book of Mormon, thank you. Um, names, 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 names. Um, he definitely, one of my best friends, definitely wasn't a major. And if nobody had, nobody had pushed him in that direction, if nobody had had an open call that said, yo, show up, then it, that all of those things that came after might not have happened. So if it's a matter of you don't have enough black majors, I can't imagine that you don't have enough black students on campus to, that you can't, fill, you can't fill five, six roles. 
So it's just a matter of, I don't know, uh, maybe spreading out, spreading out where, where you're looking. The question of diversity was not um, just centered around uh, ethnic diversity. It was also income background, um, anything else, majors, anything else, people who can be active in theater. Of course, uh, um, racial was a, is a big part of it. But that was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wide, maybe widening that pool a little bit. Thank you. you know? yeah. I don't know. Just, I just wanted to quickly address that we're having the same issue I teach at Montgomery College. We have uh, three campuses, and the campuses have their own personalities, they have their own student populations. But one of the things I want to experiment with is what is theater? And I know that you guys do that here as well. So we're talking about, when we're talking about, uh, to piggyback, project specific work. I think that if you also think about, and I'm, I'm sure you guys are doing this as well, but continue creating opportunities that come from conversations. The conversations th that with a uh, discipline, conversations with a club, will create something that may not have started off as a play that was produced somewhere else, that is a brick and mortar kind of on the stage play, but I know you guys are playing with things that are site specific. I just encourage you to keep on doing those kinds of projects. And what you're gonna find is that it's, we're gonna probably, the theater for it to continue to grow, is probably gonna leave this building. It's going to be in somebody else's community. It's going to be site specific. It's gonna be those types of things. So continue to develop your conversation skills with different, um, uh, uh, the, the, the very audiences that you want to, uh, I said audiences and I think I meant that. The very people you wanna be in conversation with both in the process backstage, on stage, and out there in your audience. Keep looking for that audience and let the theater find them as opposed to trying to bring them in. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for a great performance again. We have, we have time for one last question. I know a family, so this is so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Hello. My name is Sayla. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. And um, I wanted to ask, since you said that um, people in Sweden never heard of Lorraine Hansberry, and I wanted to know if any play, playwright in Sweden was just as powerful as Lorraine Hansberry, and who they are, and who we need to know. First, first of all, one of the things I've learned is for the question, and secondly, the answer is no. <laughs> no. Thank you. Hello. Hello. My name is Saraya Me, and I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. And I wanted to ask how the play related to the theme, how is being African American then and now, is it different? or do you feel it's the same? Where are you, Lorraine? <laughs> uh, but thank you, first of all, for the question. Uh, I think it's something for all of us, really, isn't it? Um, does anyone else want to take it up? It's... Um, <laughs> it's, it's, this, it's the same, and it's moved on. I think the details change, but the, s the rhythm kind of stays similar. You know? Our black rhythm stays, our family stays, our hopes and our dreams stay. Um, the struggle continues wherever we are. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone.